Greetings, you've landed at the VUC, IP Communications and VoIP Community. We would like to thank Simwood.com for their support. Simwood can turn you as a developer into a telco. Our hosted PBX is from OnSIP.com. You can go to GetOnSIP.com for a URL people can click to call you. We've been privileged over the last five years to be using the best conference bridge on the planet. Yes, I'm talking about ZipDX.com, full color, full featured, full HD conference bridge. Our website, VUC.me on the web, is hosted by Bluehost.com. And our worldwide local rate dial-ins are from Voxbone.com. All right, thank you, Michael. And a nice graphic, don't you agree, Peter? That was great. Our guests will talk about that in just a minute. Uh, a couple of events we need to uh, bring you up to speed on. Camellio World in Berlin, Germany, in um, May 27th. Wait a minute. We are May already, so just in a couple of days, really. 27th to 29th. A lot of us will be there. I think Tim's going to be there. I think the Wire guy is going to be there. Well, I mean, <laughs> a bunch of other people are going to be there, and it's it's a great event. It's a lot of fun. And, oh, yes, James, maybe Andy, uh, lots of the VUC people. The next one is in June in Lisbon, Portugal, 13th and 14th of June. It's um, Tad Hack. And again, you'll meet some of the same suspects. The usual suspects will be there and also other people, new people that you maybe haven't met. So if you're in Europe, go to one or, one or both of those. Um, just a quick comment that uh, Astrocon, of course, October 13th to 15th in Orlando, Florida, and we'll be having more news from them. Ironically, the uh, film strip is covering the dates of Glucon, but I know it's in early August, right? So uh, August 3rd to 6th. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> August 3rd to 6th. 3rd to 6th. And Michael's going to take over now because obviously I have not had enough uh, Chardonnay. Uh, we'll fix that immediately, but while we're fixing that, we'll get Michael to introduce our guest. Thanks for uh, arranging this, and thanks for doing all you do, Michael. You're doing a great job. Oh, well, thank you, Randy. And um, hello, Peter. Um, it's uh, nice to finally meet you. Uh, I have experienced the efforts of your, well, the, the results of your efforts for a long time, but we've never met. I feel like a magician talking to somebody from the audience. We've never met, have we? <laughs> um, no, it's good to be here. Thanks. Um, so Peter is with And Yet, but before we get to And Yet, let, let's actually start back in the beginning, because uh, our common first question here at the VUC is to find out what was it that drew you into technology in the first place? It's a little, finding out a little about, a little about the person, and then we'll move on to the company. Well, I guess I started getting into computers back in junior high school, probably, you know, and taking some little programming classics, basic and Fortran, and things like that at the time. Um, I did, sort of did some of that for a while and then had a bit of a deep university. I didn't actually do much technology stuff. I was more into music and uh, studied philosophy and ancient Latin and Greek and things like this. Um, and then I kind of slowly got back into technology. I was working uh, for, I got went to work for an early internet company in New Jersey that we did intranets for people. And so I started getting into, I worked there really doing writing and editing for the web. We were, this was in the days when there were print materials and we were trying to get them to work on the internet or intranets at the time. Um, then started getting into, back into programming there and just admin stuff and we were a small company and so kind of had to do everything and that's where I started to get more involved back in technology. That was in the mid-1990s. Cool. It, it's funny. There's a lot of parallels there. Um, uh, although uh, my spin so tended after that, to be more marketing. Yeah. My, um, my wife and I moved to Denver in 1999, and I was a remote worker for this company in New Jersey, which we didn't have nice things like Google Hangouts and WebRTC and Talky and things like that. Um, so I got a little lonely and went to work for a local company, and the first week uh, I was there, I met Jeremy Miller, who was had started the Jabber project. Um, so this was in late 99. I got involved with Jabber. Um, I still run Jabber.org. Uh, so I really came to 
all of this voice and video stuff from the IM side. Um, back in 2005, after we'd had Jabber Technologies for about six years or so, Google uh, released Google Talk uh, that used XMPP, Jabber XMPP technologies for the signaling. Uh, so that's really when I got m more interested in voice and video was when Talk came out at that time and started helping to define the jingle specs, the voice and video goodness that we use today. Cool, cool. And and so, how do we make the leap to and yet, or how does, what were the origins of and yet, and and, and you're uh, coming to them? Well, and yet started by Adam Brault, and he started it as just by himself, and has slowly bootstrapped it. So it's uh, we have about 35 people at this point. Um, really three different things that we do. One is uh, a security team. We have a security team called Lift Security. They do security penetration testing and audits and things like, you know, for GitHub and companies like that. Um, we have a more of a group that does JavaScript, Node.js, scaling, ops, things related to high-scale JavaScript, both front-end and back-end. And then we have the hockey team. Um, and all of those teams use some common folks in the, in, in the company that know a lot about design. So we, we're not just developers. We like to have a lot of design flair to the things that we build. Uh, so we have a few folks uh, on, our, on, on an internal design team as well. Um, Talkie came out of work that we did back in 2012, I believe it was, for AT&T, they were getting interested in, in this emerging WebRTC stuff, and we built an early SDK for them called att.js, still out there on the interweb somewhere, and, and AT&T has recently um, sort of relaunched that. Uh, out of that came some early experience with the website of WebRTC, which we're very passionate about making things easier for web developers to use. And that was kind of an early demo of that. And we built something called Conversatio, which then morphed into Talkie. And it's a way for us to learn about these technologies. And we, but we also use it ourselves, right? So we have a distributed team, people all over the world have an immediate video chat and something that we don't have to set up and things like that. And so we use Talkie all, all day long, really, for, for our team internally. Yeah, and Talkie, you know, my first encounter with Talkie was early in 2013 when Andy Smith and I had a little play with it. And I must say, um, leading up to today's call, I tried like heck to hack some CSS to get Talkie over a green so that I could green screen the little animated rocket into the scene with us today. But it, I didn't quite pull that off. I'm not the, the programmer that, uh, that your team uh, Maybe more typical, typically. Well, we, we, you can um, talk go to, talk um, was great. You can go to talkylander.com, by the way, and play the lander game to your heart's content. <laughs> That's good info. <laughs> it's cute. It's cute. And and uh, it, it, I used it when I was trying to get uh, some former coworkers to to make more use of video within the organization. I used it as a, a peanut to hold their attention while we were trying to pull some things together. Um, but there's a lot of news, right? Like Talkie has gone on, and it, it's not static. You're extending it. You're doing things with it. What What's new in that front? Well, so Talkie <clears throat> started kind of as an experiment. Um, hey, there's James in the car. Um, <laughs> on his car phone. Uh, so Talkie um, started with Simple WebRTC, which is a library that we've built that we were, again, we're trying to make it easier for web developers to actually get stuff done and use these technologies. Um, we have since, we're working on an updated version of Talkie. So we have the Talkie and a Talkie iOS app, um, but we're working to make it more robust. Um, so we've changed it around the signaling. We actually use XMPP and Jingle for the signaling in the beta version version that we're launching before too much longer. Um, that <clears throat> enables us to do several things. We get chat for free. We get file transfer for free. We've got a lot of code around w XMPP and the web, a whole um, some JavaScript libraries there that are all open source. Um, so we have a lot of, obviously, I know a lot about XMPP as well because I've been wrote all the specs for it all over the years. 
Um, so we have a lot of code and um, protocol extensions there that we can just reuse and makes it easy for us to add new features. Uh, so that's a lot of what we've been trying to do is make it more extensible um, and also to have some different um, interaction models. Um, so you know there's the Hangout model where everyone has video. Um, we have customers who are interested in maybe audio and screen sharing or sometimes even just audio and text for customer service applications. Um, so there's a, we we test the different media types um, and do that in a flexible way. And so that's a lot of what we've been doing is, is building out the architecture for us to do that. Uh, on the video side, we we're using the Jitsi Video Bridge, which we which we um, like a lot. And obviously, I've I've worked with Emil and some of the Jitsi folks over the years through IETF and open source efforts. Uh, so we use the video bridge for the for scaling some things up. We're very interested in some broadcast scenarios, building something similar to Hangouts on Air that we're using here. Um, you know, for some more broadcast kind of like e-education things, We've, there's a lot of interest that I see in WebRTC to build different sorts of experiences than folks have right now in some of the online education systems. Um, switching easily back and forth between a large presenter mode and then peer learning where we break into small groups and bring people back. Those sorts of things are not so easy in some of the things that people use for this stuff, but we'd like to make it easier for folks to build that kind of application. So that, a lot of what we've been doing is on the architecture side and, and putting a lot of that groundwork in place so that we can now build a lot more interesting applications with the underlying technology. And and how's it been received? I mean, Taki as a project is interesting enough, but how does that go forward into the market for and yet? I mean, has it? Have you been getting traction? Do do you have you know is the customer base growing? Uh, are you getting kicked? I mean, it, what's happening there? Yeah, we um so we haven't strongly pursued it as a product to date. We do have some customers who use it on-premise. Uh, they like the interface, but they, for security reasons, they want to be able to run it behind the firewall. Uh, so we have an on-site version that folks can use and, pa and we've packaged up for, for that purpose. Um, we haven't really pushed it too strongly as a from the on-site stuff yet, uh, in part because we're more of a consulting and custom development shop or have been to date and making that transition to a product company is can be interesting obviously and we've kind of cobbled together uh, some investment of our own in the technology but we're not since we don't have investors we're a bootstrapped company some of that investment goes more slowly than it would than if we had you know VC money or something like that um, we prefer the bootstrapped route because it's kind of a longer term play for us. We don't really want to sell out and get acquired. We like to be an independent firm. Um, so we've invested in it over time. We're starting to look more seriously at um, both the hosted and on-site versions uh, that folks, folks actually pay for. But a lot of what we do, Michael, is we use the underlying open source code that we've built as well as the Jitsi video server that we use. Uh, to build products for people who want things in this space. So if they want to do integrate voice and video or screen sharing into an existing, let's say, a peer learning application that they have where they do pair programming and stuff like that. Well, now it's very easy for us to build those sorts of products for people, whether it's customer service, um, telemedicine, education. Those are kind of the big ones that we see uh, people being interested in. Uh, that's kind of where our bread and butter has always been, doing that kind of custom app development and consulting around this kind of thing. So it's really more of an in-house tool set than that you use and, and a calling card to, to go forward with you know, ideas that other people want that end up being custom uh, implementations. Well, that's that's right. awesome. Uh, what, and, 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 and so is that... There was this idea, and, and by the way, I, I, I'm going to return to this because this one... Of all the graphics we've done for um, for shows, uh, BUCs in the past, this one was was a treat uh, because I robbed a little graphic 
that was involved in the Kickstarter announcement for Talkie, and and then bent it to our uh, to our needs. And I was so tempted to find a friend to animate the little robots, but uh, in the in the time allocated, I couldn't get that done. Um, what's up with the Kickstarter uh, effort? Uh, that's relatively recent, like just the past couple weeks too. Yeah, we actually haven't started it yet. We uh, hit some glitches at the end. You actually have to get your Kickstarter approved and take a little bit of time. It's okay. like an iOS app, right? You can't just launch the thing, and this is a review process. Uh, so okay. that'll be starting soon. Um, so we, you know, we've invested in it on our own. Um, mm -hmm. We'd like to bootstrap some more investment in it, and since we're not, don't have investors and don't really want to take be taking VC money. Or angels, investors, and things. I mean, some further development would be the right way to do it. Um, so, some of the things that we're interested in building out, uh, we want to do some more of these broadcasts kind of scenarios where we could maybe have a hundred people that we could broadcast out to on the audio side, and then maybe have one or two presenters, kind of the same sort of model that we're looking at here. We have some folks who are very interested in this, some of our existing customers who want to do online coaching, uh, training, e-education, e those sorts of things. Um, so we'd like to be able to build out some of that. We'd like to be able to do recording um, so that for company meetings and things like that or a hangouts on air sort of scenario, I could record it and then I could have that video available and we could do that on the server side so that we don't have to record it on someone's machine, that sort of thing. Um, so broadcasting and recording are two of the big ones that we'd like to have a little bit more money to put into as an investment and get um, our iOS app to support that stuff and maybe build out an Android app or um, you know some native apps for Mac and Linux and Windows and things like that. So those are things that uh, we've had people ask for. We've added some features that folks have asked for, so now we have text chat and, and larger meetings we can support with the video bridge uh, helping us out as an SFU in the middle. We can do 15, 20 people at a time, uh, so that's great, but we'd like to really pursue in some of the broadcast and recording scenarios and uh, you know, having some, some further money that comes in and also kind of building the buzz around it, right, that, hey, you know, this is an alternative platform in case... I want to be able to run it myself because we're trying to make it so that all these components are open source and that it's something that you could run on your own if you wanted to and we have to do some packaging and documentation and things like that to make that easier for folks. And you know all that stuff takes time and, and effort to getting a little bit more interest in investment from especially from folks in the indie web community who really like that sort of thing. It's a lot of those folks maybe aren't so comfortable using Skype or Hangouts from things from big companies. You know, they like to use things that they are independent companies or things that they can run on their own. Yeah, boy, do I know that. We we now have uh, within ZipDX a private Jabber server that we just use internally because it happens that one of our devs is you know really into having total control of critical infrastructure. Um, uh, so. I'm just looking at some notes here, and um, I mean, clearly, hey, early days of, of, uh, of Jabber and XMPP, this is all really uh, the stuff you're very experienced in. Do you have any opinions on ORTC and, and how, the, how the, the next generation of WebRTC is coming along? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about ORTC. Um, we actually use something kind of similar in a way in the next version of Talkie because we don't use the SDP directly. What we actually do is convert SDP into Jingle, which is the is which is the XMPP extension, and then we JSONify that thing and it gives us sort of an object oriented model for things. And so that actually what we've been doing there maps very nicely into ORTC. Um, Obviously, it gives you a lot more fine-grained control over things, which our devs get excited about because, hey, now we can do more interesting things. Uh, from the developer experience perspective, which is very important to us, we will be building that ORTC support into Simple Web RTC so that you don't really, you won't need to know as a web developer that you've got some of that power underneath. We wouldn't necessarily expose that kind of I, I am excited about it 
as, from the developer perspective. I think it's going to make us give us the ability to build things more easily than we can right now. And so we're, and, we're definitely on board with ORTC and, and we'll be supporting that in our libraries. Do you think that that removes a big roadblock from sort of, because there's been talk, a, a lot of anticipation of, you know, any web dev anywhere is going to be able to deploy voice and video. It's going to be easy. But in reality, it hasn't been easy. It, 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 we're chasing this dream still, and we're a few years down the road already, and uh, some of us are maybe a little frustrated that it hasn't been easier than it is. Does, does, is this a, a step then? particularly as you guys wrap it into libraries, is that a step in the direction of your average web dev being able to jump on this stuff without having an associate who's also a telecom developer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, so that there's the rub, right? So it's going to be easier for people to build prototypes. Um, and we, were, you know, that's something that we're trying to do is make the libraries out there available so that, yeah, you can get something up and running. We were working with a customer recently who does some... Um, online coaching kind of stuff. And yeah, they were able to get pretty far using Simple WebRTC, which is the library that we have. They didn't know anything about that the fact that they needed to run a turn server. And so th sometimes things just wouldn't work. Um, to get it to the point where now they want to make a more robust service, so they was just kind of a prototype or an alpha that they built. Now they want to figure out whether this is something that potentially they could roll out to their customers. Well, now they need some help, right? Because they don't know anything about turn. They don't know anything about scaling it up and things would fall over because they were using full mesh for the video. Why isn't this really scaling very f much farther than four or five people? Well, let's describe to you, you know, you might need a piece yeah. in the middle like the Jitsi video bridge that's going to act as an SFU. Oh, they're kind of interested in recording. How would that happen? Well, you've only got a full mesh there, right? And so how are you going to do the recording? All those sorts of things are difficult. And I don't personally see them becoming a lot easier anytime soon. Um, unfortunately, right? It'd be great if these things were really easy. So although we've put a lot of work into the developer experience and trying to make it easier for people to build this stuff, I think to actually deploy robust applications is it's just too hard, right? There's just too many things that we know about, you guys know more about than I do, um, to make all this go. Um, so I do think that we there's been somewhat of a democratization of the development around this, and that's all to the good. I think there's kind of a limit, not based on what we can do with the front-end libraries, but just the back-end infrastructure and being able to monitor that and knowing what to stand up and what ports to run your turn server on. All that kind of stuff is just not very unfamiliar for web developers. What you're kind of describing reminds me of, um, of sort of, you know, anybody can throw up a WordPress site and buy some WooThemes plugins and do a, a smidgen of e-commerce, but that doesn't give them Amazon.com. Right, and 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 so it, it's sort of the leap into the leap from uh, craft and cottage to something really broadly deployable. I think is yeah, still going to yeah. require some expertise. Although I think what one aspect, Michael, of that democratization of the development is that it has gotten easier. Right, when when Randy started VUC in 2007, and you had to know a lot more about SIP servers, and I mean it was harder, right? It, and I think part of what's happened because of that is it's become easier to build applications. And so what I'm seeing a lot of is that we don't really have these general purpose sorts of applications, even something like Jitsi on the client side, right, before they did the video bridge. Hey, you know, we'll have our soft client and everyone will use some generic soft clients. That's not where things have gone. Where things have gone is because of the democratization of development, both on the web and on mobile, we have people building their own apps. So if I'm going to talk to my insurance claims agent with my insurance claim, my insurance company, I'm going to use their app. They're going to have their own special app. Now maybe it'll get be something white labeled and we built built by someone else. But there's really going there's a great fragmentation I think going on in the application space because of that democratization of making it easier for people to develop these things. 
Excellent, excellent. Um, you have, uh, I don't know if you're monitoring our IRC channel, but you have fans. <laughs> and and yet has fans generally of you know there are a lot of developers out there who when you talk about democratization sort of making these tools available to a broad group of people um, we've seen some efforts on the part of uh, other folks for example uh, onsip has spent you know a better part of a year and a half in a big push touring around saying hey look at this infrastructure we built and and you can run it and, and wrap around it and and make it yours in essence uh, I'm curious just how the dev community is receiving that and, and whether we're seeing you know, new ideas. Because it seems to me that the ideas you've listed so far, the telemedicine and this sort of stuff, these were kind of already things that the polycoms and the Cisco's of the world kind of had some hooks in. But uh, have you seen anything novel and interesting coming out that's maybe enabled by people who weren't in this space already? That's a good question, Michael. I think that part, you know, if you go to the, the WebRTC expos and stuff like that, it's still a lot of folks from the more of the traditional telecommunications community. I don't mm. think we've really touched a chord yet with your average web developer. Now, part of that might be might be some of the browser issues, right? And so, well, it's only going to work in Chrome, Firefox, and Opera. And I don't really have it in Safari and IE yet, but there's sort of workarounds for that. And you can do some plugins and Temesis and folks that have plugins for those sorts of scenarios. I I don't think we've really made things easy enough for the typical web developer yet. And so yeah, we've seen some interesting things. You know, I know at the there was an event last year that Chris Kernke and uh, put on at Google and in San Francisco and the, some of the folks from TalkBox were showing some neat little applications and of course there's there's Tim's little pet uh, you know check on your pet application of course we always have to mention that one but um, I still don't think we've quite made things easy enough for in the sense that you know for normal not normal but for non media applications we've mm -hmm. got very easy to use JavaScript frameworks this react and uh, you know things like that that really make it easy for folks to build stuff, and I don't really think we're quite there yet in, on the media side. Even to build kind of prototypey things, um, it's not quite ready for prime time. That's my feeling. Now, and, you know, so it's your typical web dev. They just want that little thing where they've only got a couple function calls to make and good things happen. And we've tried to do that with simple WebRTC things like that. I just don't think that we've either shown folks those sorts of applications yet or that they really know as a broader web community that things like that are available. So we're going to have, what you're saying is we're going to have another round of, of, uh, of uh, WebRTC conferences and greater growing WebRTC presence at the HTML5 conferences. And, and you guys hosted your own conference, which I thought was novel when it first happened. And so there'll be more of that before we actually see the big impact that we were all expecting. Yeah, we're actually talking about bringing our little conference back later this year, but uh, real, the real-time conference. Um, so that's a lot of what we were trying to do with that is cross-pollinate folks who know about telecommunications and media and video and messaging, things on high scale there with web developers because web developers have been in a separate space and trying to bring those communities together, you know, put, putting, the, putting your peanut butter in my chocolate or whatever. And uh, it's still, I think it, there's still a lot of work to be done there. I, I, I just want to kick in there because I've been spending the last... Um, few months working with web developers um, and I don't think it's complexity per se I don't think it has to get any simpler because if you look at the amount of effort they go to to get the CSS exactly right or the the the, the behavior right and, and all of that stuff it, it, they're not afraid of complexity but I think it's just somehow you know that blob of SDP and and, and, and that stuff is just so alien and ugly that they just don't want to dirty their hands with it almost. I don't know, but I, I feel like it isn't just complexity. It's something to do with the way we're presenting the APIs and, and, and what we're doing, I think, to some extent. Yeah, you make a good point, Tim. I think you know, we've tried to abstract away from those things, 
with our simple WebRTC libraries, and I think that um, ORTC is going to get us farther down that path because it's going to be more object oriented. You're, you're totally right. No one wants to look. Um, I think also, Tim, though, that there's some of the interaction models are maybe not as familiar to folks. Like, what do I actually? You know, we know we've they've used Hangouts and Skype and things like that, but to make more novel use of something like audio or video in an application, I don't know. It's it seems like it's a little bit unclear to folks. Well, what am I actually going to do with this? And the the you know when you're on video, it's a very kind of blocking or audio. You're 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 doing something and you're very much immersed in it and that those have traditionally been very immersive applications to sort of have that be on the side or mi mix it in a little bit is not really clear to me and how you really do that in a productive way you, you know what I'm saying oh yeah and no, I mean I think you're right that the, the interaction model issue is is very definitely something that people need to work on but what I'm I think there's an, in, an, an initial resistance even from the designers to get, get into that space because it somehow it feels too, too alien to them. And I, I, I mean, I think that the, you know, the real-time conference and stuff like that and being present at HTML5 conferences is, is, is great just to kind of get people's attention. And the fact that Facebook are doing it helps kind of. You know, it's like, well, if they're doing it, then maybe, maybe you should. Um, so I think that's... That's helping, but it, it's not. Um, it is actually surprisingly difficult to get people to kind of um, engage with it. Uh, well, even yeah. the things like the the WhatsApps and the Facebook messengers and stuff like that, those are communications applications, right? It's not like I have an e-commerce site and I've got a little something on the side that we where we sprinkle in some communications, right? Now, there's obviously the you know your little chat things and so on. Um, you could have a greeter on the way through things and help you out later in the in the sales process, or if you were dithering over what exactly you wanted to buy, then they would kind of help you out and those sorts of things. There, yeah, the Facebooks and the WhatsApps and the Snapchats and so on and so forth. But they they typically have a dedicated communications application. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, I think that's true. And I mean, I think maybe to some extent we're kidding ourselves from the, you know, the real-time communication world that actually people want more voice and video than they really do. You know, when you look at how I work through the day, I make a few video calls, but I also do a lot more chat because it's more convenient. I can manage my time better, and as you say, it's less immediately immersive and disruptive. And I think. You know, we've been deceived by the fact that the telephone was so successful into thinking that, like, that's how it's always going to be. And actually, I don't think it is. I think we, we're happier with that only being a small percentage of our time. Um, and we should just, maybe we should just uh, um, admit that and, and focus on where it really adds value rather than trying to spread it everywhere. Yeah, you, I think that's a very good point, Tim. Um you know, you see something like Slack, I mean, this is sort of a hip chat, right? These are things that people hang out in all day long. And there's, it's easier to do integrations between that and, um, you know, GitHub or my check-ins or Trello, if I'm using that for project management or my Twitter feed. All those things can get fed in, right? And I now have some sort of text that pops up and notifications and I can deal with that. Most people, do, you wouldn't want that to be happening all the time with, audio, right? Tim just did a check-in on this branch of this GitHub project Ooh. and you'd have audio all the time interrupting you, right? That's, that's too much Too much handling it with text. You can then do full text searching and keyword matching and all that kind of thing. Can yeah, I? Cool. Go for yeah, it. No, I was just going <laughs> to interject a reality check here for everybody. I was just asking my wife today. She goes, she has a two and a half hour train trip to go to these meetings and I go, no, come on. Every one of these meetings has to be you in person. And she said most of the time it does because, first of all, the number of people varies. Remember, these aren't meetings, identical meetings each time. Otherwise, I would, ins I would say, look, let's get these people <laughs> to know what they're doing and get online. But um, in the real world, I mean, 
things are variable like that. And so they sometimes have documents that they physically want to pass back and forth. I mean, the world hasn't changed overnight for that. And among the folks that we all know, yeah, I mean, if you... I'm not going to come over to Argentina to talk to somebody for 20 minutes. So if, if we can do that over video and exchange documents, fine. But that's not really what a lot of people are going to do. I've got some other questions, but they have nothing to do with what we're talking about now. So I will Well, you make a good more. point, though, Randy. I mean, I think that we haven't, those of us who build these sorts of applications, we have a long way to go before you could have that sort of immersive experience where we're going over a document together or working at a whiteboard together. And yeah, there's whiteboarding apps and co-editing apps and things like that, right? But they're just not very natural and immersive enough to feel like you're really collaborating, right? Co-working, working working together on something in real time. That's exactly right. Uh, The the biggest problem, you know, you mentioned whiteboard, for example, is a common common, uh, paradigm, right, of people you're working, you're showing people stuff. Or slides, and we mentioned slides, I know Michael mentioned, do you have any slides or anything? Point is, we don't really want to know about all that stuff. You just want to be able to go, oh, here, by the way, uh, look at this, you know, I mean, you... That's what a real meeting's like, and it's never that easy. So basically, I guess we're all agreeing that it's kind of an interface problem more than anything else. Because I mean, the stuff can be done. You can send things out. Well, that, that but that's great though, because now we still have a lot more work to do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and and there's a, a Java protocol element to be written to to describe it. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I was work, did some work with some folks at MITRE years ago. This was probably over 10 years ago. And they were interested in something they were calling collaborative data objects, right? So instead of me putting together a PowerPoint, they might want to do, like, let's say, a field exercise and the and on the screen, and they would tell the boat to go over here and things like that, right? Working on something in real time, we still don't have any sort of good technologies for this. And... Uh, I would love to get there, but I think it's going to require some combination of better physical in- devices, right? So if I've got a whiteboard, I should be able to write on it, and my little pen would move around, and you reality interface on your screen, and then you would be able to work along with me, right? The, actually, co-work like that, we just don't have those things yet, but I, I think we'll get there. It should maybe take a while. Actually, let's see if I can... <laughs> Wrong color. Actually, I do ha- have that going, okay? But, uh, even, but it's pretty primitive, right? Yeah, oh, seriously primitive. But even um, uh, even um, screen sharing, and I'm talking people, when I made that comment, Peter, when you joined about, well, look at this, here's somebody who's been in tech for years, and he actually sounds and looks good. Fact is, even your most advanced, now how do I get rid of this? Even your most advanced people who know all about all these techs, like, I just couldn't get rid of that. <laughs> uh, you know, it's the screen share. We've been through this on this conference since we've been doing Hangouts. The screen share itself, which is nothing, right? Just, it should, you, just, you should be able to just say, okay, I'm going to share a screen. And really, the only way to do this would be if the, uh, the, al- the computer, whatever's running, knew already what you wanted to do. If there was some way you could indicate it more easily. Because there's like six clicks. You've got to choose the screen, what window. I've got three screens running right now too so it would be a nightmare wanted to also in passing say hello to Dan York who's with us and if he's on if he's uh, gets on IRC he might even be able to get a word in edgewise hey Dan nice to see hi, you hi Randy hi Peter good to see you hey Dan how are you good back to moderator Michael maybe to uh, hold things together I, I actually had a, one one question tracking back to the discussion about Jitsi um, how do you feel about the, 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 the Jitsi acquisition? Does that make you feel edgy about using it, or, or are you happy for them, or how does that play out? Um, that's a, yeah, interesting, interesting, Tim. Um, you know, I've known the Jitsi folks for years. Probably, I probably met them at FOSDEM in two, potentially somewhere back then. Um, you know, I, I know some of the folks at Atlassian and HipChat. I think they. They have a pretty good dedication to open source about on this one. Um, I think um, there's actually going to be some further development that will happen. Like I was mentioning earlier, some of the broadcast scenarios. Um, I think that's probably, if I were HipChat, I'd probably be interested in that some of that stuff too. Uh, so I'm, I think it's going to be a good thing. Um, 
I'm excited to see where some of that further development goes. Obviously, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and sometimes priorities change and maybe they won't get as much investment there into that code base as people might hope. But I think I think it's going to be good overall for, for the Jitsi Video Bridge. I think if I were using the Jitsi client, I might not be as happy because I think that's not some, somewhere that the focus is going to be. But for the Video Bridge side of it, I think it's going to be a good thing. Right. And, you know, but obviously there's a lot of ferment in this industry. I mean, uh, Tropo just got acquired, and last year or whatever it was, Ad Live, and so on. So, uh, part of what we try to do in And Yet is stay independent, um, and you know, we're not for sale and won't be, and don't want to be acquired, and like our little independent team that we have. But uh, I think we're going to continue to see that, and. It's great if you have something like Jitsi where it's open source, right? But if your company that you're using as a service provider gets acquired and then by a competitor especially or something like that, you might not be as happy. But I, that's not sort of, that's not really the situation that I see here as much. You know, being on the VUC itself is kind of a kiss of death because half the people who come on here get acquired sooner or later. Hopefully there's no casualty uh, with that. Interesting. There was a question uh, arising out of the IRC a little earlier that I promised I would get to, and and uh, had to do with um, protocols specifically. Somebody who, from the telecom world was asking if anything about Talkie was um, had any kind of SIP interop, or if it was all XMPP and and WebRTC. Um, is there anything SIPish underneath that or involved? Yeah, we don't. So we have just done web and mobile. Um, we haven't tried to integrate with PBXs. We haven't done, tried to do PSTN dial-out uh, integration with those sorts of services, um, mostly because we're not trying to be an enterprise software company. If we were, we would pursue that kind of stuff. Um, if we had folks who would probably use either some of the SIP uh, interop that comes maybe as part of the Jitsi project. So they have some code that does that. Um, potentially free switch or asterisk or something like that. We would talk with those folks to do that sort of interop, but at, to date we don't have any native SIP or any uh, dial out to any sort of SIP systems. Okay. But, you know, cool. I've done a lot of work over the years, Michael, on that interoperability between SIP and XBP. I've got some RFCs that are done and some that are coming on that score for a whole range of features. So uh, the, on the signaling side, that translation is actually fairly easy. When we developed Jingle way back in the day, we had some of that in mind to be for at least for basic use cases to be able to do um, protocol translation. And then obviously once you get to the media side, you're, everyone's using DTLS, SRTP, and so on and so forth. So I think that we could do that, and we've tried to, I've tried to over the years make it something that is fairly straightforward, but it's not something that we've pursued yet in Talkie itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, always to uh, encourage questions from the IRC channel. Also, if there's anybody who's on ZipDX who wants to uh, pose a question, uh, star six to unmute yourself and step on up. Um, what about other aspects of AND yet? I mean, outside of WebRTC and all of this stuff, are, are there um, you say you have a, design, a small design team as a shared resource. Um, I'm really, really somewhat interested on how these sort of, I won't say disinterested, but people who are not in the front lines of the WebRTC, you know, real-time world, how they see that. Because I think one of the things we're kind of suffering is we need to, we need to get people to envision new ways of of, of adding real-time things to what are traditionally not real-time processes, and whether you call it communication enabled business processes or something other you know or or the mayday button i mean it's all kind of how can i how can real time add value to things that we don't think of as being real time right it's a design question sometimes i think yeah i mean we've we put a lot of try to put a lot of design sense into the communication side of what we've built but we haven't really done work to integrate that with some of the other things that we do. So we do have customers who approach us who want to build some of these aspects into the applications they have. 
Um, and then we do a lot of work with them on those, on what the user experience could be like for those. But we don't idly muse about, well, what could we do to integrate some of this with, let's say, our security stuff that we do? Because we have a security team, right? So, well, are there you know, sort of some real-time things that we could do about security or, you know, audio alerts or something like that? It's not something that we've really pursued yet. Um, it's more because we're really a custom software shop and consulting shop. We're kind of driven interested in, and that's what we tend to build and focus on. So for those things, we put a lot of design sense into them from a UX perspective. I, I guess what I've so, sort of identified is I think that in the world of design, um, there's a task that remains to sort of excite some designers about bringing in tools that they haven't traditionally used. Um, and and that's, that's still a task sort of before the world uh, to cause this thing to be more widespread, I, w I would think. So. Well, that's an interesting suggestion is that um, instead of sort of approaching some of this from the developer side, approach it from the design side. Uh, well, that's give a that's shout where out UX to, to from, right? Wire uh, and the web app there because they, you know, they they put a lot of effort into making the the web app look the way they want it to look, and and then put well not and then put the communication in, but to support the communication that it has to look the way they want it to look. And I, I mean, I know from having watched them at it, a huge amount of effort has been gone into to to achieve that. Um, so it can be done. But I know, you know, it's it's a rarer thing, I'm afraid. Yeah, I think there's more experimentation going on there too. I mean, the, the Speak IO that came out recently, where you can kind of see who's talking to each other on your team, and then maybe join a conversation. That's, I think there's some there's a lot more work that could be done there from the design side for sure. But I think there's more people starting to think about that as it as as we were discussing as it becomes easier and to develop this sort of application. Cool. Well, I will uh, ask once again for questions from the floor. We have 12 on ZipDX who we can't see, and uh, a couple I'm not familiar with, and some that I am. Um, so what's next for you? What what What's the next sort well, of... Well, I'm, I'm excited about this kind of stuff we were talking about to really make collaboration I hate to use the word seamless, but uh, you know, make it more natural, make it a more organic experience. And I think that there's so much that we could do so that Randy's uh, friend here isn't driving two hours on the train in order to have a meeting and, and get something done in person. Now, obviously, there's no replacement for meeting a person and sharing a meal and all those sorts of things. And uh, but. Ideally, we would be able to get some of these technologies to the point where you don't have to do that stuff unless you really do want to meet up. Um, and there's a lot that we need to do to get there. Um, like I was saying, maybe some augmented reality kinds of things and better physical devices, you know, so that you can integrate with goggles that you're wearing and things like that. I'm sure folks at Google and Apple are actively working on these sorts of things. Um, Amazon probably too, but um, th you know, I think there's a, that's something I'm very passionate about is helping people work together better. And there's so much that we, so much that's happened in the last few years in terms of um, tooling around that, but there's a long way that we have to go, I think, to make it really natural for folks to collaborate and work together over distances. You know, I'm sorry, I thought you were done. No, oh, after you, Randy. I was just well. I was just going to say, uh, with regards to this challenge, and uh, since you're personally uh, interested in it, if you think about teleportation, if that were possible, right? So you'd have you have to go into the booth, and then the thing takes you apart and does whatever it is, science fiction. But if conferencing, if you teleportation, you go to the portal, and they're standardized, and they only do that one thing. Conferencing, you've got some people like Mr. Bodie who's got 6,000 devices uh, different, you know, on different platforms. My point being, uh, and I think it's obvious, that one person's on Skype or used to Skype and they've got a laptop. Well, let's 
let me limit it to the devices or it'll take hours to talk about this. Just look at the devices, okay? Let's eliminate phones right now. Just say that's too weird because you can get no blackboard, there's no okay. You still got laptops, tablets probably. I guess we gotta say tablets, laptops, and possibly desktops. So this is awfully hard to get all this stuff to work. In the con at the conference table, you're all equal. Well, somebody might have a pen. <laughs> and you don't, but you know, at the chalkboard, you could someone, you can always tell somebody else to get up and go to the chalk. Here's the chalk. Go to the chalkboard. So what we're looking for, in my opinion, what we're looking for is the chalk. What's the chalk and the chalkboard that everybody shares? And we we're so far from that right now. So that's my two cents on that. I think that this problem has to do with device independence, platform. I mean, obviously, connection independence. What did James say there? I missed it. So too quick. That was Matrix. Oh, Matrix. Okay. Yeah, Federation. Anyway, one of the biggest problems being device independence because there's just too many out there and platforms too. You know, when Skype started, that was one of its biggest things. Works on the main platforms, no brainer, uh, blah, blah, blah. That was all its, within that context, that was its strength. That context has gone to a point where that is no, I mean, that's not a big deal anymore. It's just that it's a household word, so that's its thing now is that it's known. That's it. <laughs> Who else wants to speak? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> well, to James's point, I don't, I don't think Matrix, I mean, I've been working on IM Federation since 99, right? Um, there's just never been too much of a demand for that, and I think what you're talking about, Randy, is not really federated communication no. across providers, but how do we have some standardized interfaces? And obviously, WebRTC has done a lot for that. Right now, I've got a standardized way to get access to the camera, access to the microphone, but we're asking for access to something that doesn't even exist yet, which is that little piece of chalk that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, what Randy's expressing is sort of the the frustration that maybe a lot of us have felt about. It's not so much that we, we've come a long ways, but there's a, still a long way to go, and we're always sort of feeling we're standing near the edge of something as opposed to looking back and saying, "Wow, it's you know, there's a good distance behind us here. We're we're really more capable than we once were, but we still crave greater capabilities." Um, well, and, you know. yeah, I mean, these technologists, you know, they're always frustrated with how slow things are going. Uh, you know, I studied ancient history, and so, um, gosh, we're, uh, you know, you look at something that how long it took for print technologies to actually have an impact in the world, right? That was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. In the early days of printing, if you looked at what people printed, they would have been complaining the same way we do about the internet. Oh, it's all this astrology stuff and you know things like that. That's what people were were publishing, and oh, it's just all this junk, right? It's like the it's like the internet is, um, but it takes a long time. And so I think we are very impatient people. But if you look at where we were 20 years <laughs> ago, you know we've come a long way. And things like I mean, I think WebRTC gives us the ability to build these sorts of applications and we didn't have that five years ago right and so I would I always counsel people to be a little bit more patient yeah I keep working but uh, it's it's coming it's coming it's it's I think we'll have those things now whether it's you know in five years or 20 years I'm not sure well maybe it's like uh, the driverless car you know, someday you won't turn. There won't be a computer to turn on. Your whole house will know what you want, and uh, that'll be the end of it. And well, that could like be in five years. It could be in twenty-five years, right? Well, like you're saying, Randy. You know, you go into the little uh, portal and you get teleported, right? Maybe the, you, your office will be tricked out in such a way that you won't even ha see the whiteboard, maybe, or maybe it'll be some sort of holog holographic thing, and you can just start working, and you'll that'll be a workspace that you'll go in, and hey, it could even be in your driverless car, for all I know. Yeah, I think that all is going to come together, but as you say, uh, we don't know when. I, I saw a really lovely app um, a while ago, which isn't really real-time communication, but it could so easily be, which was somebody had a white wall, and... Um, 
position marker pen. So it, you know, it was a device where you could tell accurately where the, the tip was. Um, and they had a projector. And basically, you could draw on this white wall. And you weren't really drawing. You were just the projector was just putting black where you'd put the lines, mm. and um, and that would be so easy to send somewhere else, right? Because and somebody else could draw on it from afar, and so you. I think that those sorts of things are actually we're not. And you know, Microsoft have got what is it? The 55-inch Surface. You know, the biggest uh, tablet they're making is enormous, and yeah. that's exactly for that. It's basic. Well, it's a boardroom table. Let's be honest. It's not. It, it's not a tablet anymore. It's a boardroom table, and you will. You'll see that kind of minority report, big gesture thing of, of sweeping. You know, last year's results away and pulling in this year's or whatever. I don't know how it's going to play, but but that that kind of big, big thing is what you're talking about wanting for meetings. And then of course you end up needing lots of them because you don't all want to physically turn up in the same place. But I, I, I mean, I, I agree with Peter. I think think things are moving quite fast enough. Thank you. Um, you know, and and yes, we should see more of it. But let's 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 get the current stuff done. You know, as well. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, what we're doing here is rather unnatural. We're all sitting in these special places with the, we don't want to move because the kid we're going to get off camera, right? And then we got to have your headset, and that stuff has got to go away before you can have really natural interactions. But maybe that's how how people's offices will be five, ten years from now. So you can actually pace around, right, and do what Tim's saying, where you've got this white wall, and now we can work together. And that's a perfect example of the interim solution being with the uh, Logitech webcam that follows your face when you move and follows your body, which is absolutely horrible to look at. So <laughs> there are, you know, we take these directions, and that's, by the way, that's exactly why it takes a while to get this stuff right, because they they iterate through, and that thing, I'm not sure where that looks good. But whenever we've had somebody on one, uh, we beg them to turn it off. And um, Michael, uh, I know you feel the same way. So you remember what that well, was? Well, th yeah, that was a, a face tracking thing, which is you know that's the kind of gimmickry like putting hats on heads and hangouts. Yeah. It's sort of silly. Exactly. Um, there is a there is a company that I have approached to come talk to us though, um, and that is a, they're called Panacast, and they're doing they're about to launch their second generation little camera which they claim is a USB 3 4K camera, and, and their magic is um, when you use it with a Hangout, right, you, you can, how to, I'm not sure if I can convey this, um, it's like having pan, tilt, and zoom, but it's all virtualized within the camera, so I can get up, go to the whiteboard, and the camera will follow my action and show you the whiteboard with sufficient quality to, uh, to actually sort of engage in a natural way without having to you know, stay in front of the webcam. And I happen to like my headset, and thank you. I see you're wearing a Sennheiser, uh, Peter. Uh, I'm, I make note of such things, so <laughs> it's hard You enough. don't like cats in these kind of hangouts? <laughs> Ah, the cat in the hat talks back. Okay. We had a hat day already. <laughs> Fine. Fine. <No. laughs> yeah, I suppose it's all it's all fun and well and good. And and when it comes to the to the Halloween hangout, I'll make use of it. <laughs> so I did have a question for Peter, and maybe you already talked about it earlier, but kind of I I know a bit about where and at yet is going, but where uh, what's next for you guys? Well, as uh, we mentioned, we're going to have a Kickstarter for Talkie, so we're going to try to raise some money that way and invest more in some uh, broadcast and recording and and some higher scale uh, sorts of interactions. I want to do recently about the different interaction models, um, and we want to make that rather flexible so that we could morph from a Hangout style into uh, more of a breakout style or split people up and put people back together, um, have more of a presenter mode, and then, the, you know, those sorts of things, I think, there's no really one-size-fits-all um, interaction model, and, you know, using Hangouts for everything doesn't, it really isn't necessarily good. Do I really need the film strip at the bottom, or instead of talking really to with the primary folks who are involved? Um, so I think those interaction models were, I'm very passionate about, and we have some good folks on our design team who've been started thinking about those. Um, we are going to remain independent because that's what we are. Um, so we're seeking some crowdfunding to do some further work on Talkie, but we also have that we're doing on security side. We have a product that we're building to help monitor, not monitor, but 
figure out all your dependency chains on your Node.js apps and figure out if there's security issues related to those. So we have a security team doing some stuff on that and we're doing some fun stuff on some further development of Node.js because we do a lot of stuff in the oh, Node cool. community. So those are sort of the three things that we that we focus on, Dan. Well, it's interesting you talk about the user experience too. You know, I work now in a distributed team that is uh, that none of us, there are six of us on the team and we are all in different either offices or home offices and we never get together, you know, um, physically and actually I think I don't I don't think we'll probably ever be all physically together in, in just the way things work. So, you know, we are looking at how do you create those virtual water cooler experiences or how do you do that? You know, we tried an experiment earlier today where a bunch of us got on a, a you know a video call like this, basically, kind of thing, where we just had the windows open while we were doing work. You know, I mean so just ways to help build those human connections when between people that you get if you're in an office, but you don't get if you're in a virtual kind of environment. So I think, you know, those kind of things are useful to think about is, is how do you enable that kind of, um, those kind of interactions and collaboration, you know, across the internet because we have this amazing capability to do so. Yeah, there was a, you remember Squiggle? There was a company that was, um, th that didn't really go. I mean, we have a, our design team does this, right? They do a hangout and they just sort of, chill out yeah. and work together and they compare notes once in a while and maybe half an hour goes by and no one says anything. Um, Squiggle never, you know, I don't think a lot of people want to work like that all the time. Right. Which is what Squiggle was doing. But um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, you know, we have these kind of ways of doing things when we're in person, right? We all, let's have lunch. Let's meet for coffee. Let's just chill out. Let's work together. Let's be in, a, in this these are things that humans have evolved, you know, for thousands and millions of years, how we actually interact. And transferring some of that into the virtual space, yeah, there's all been all these experiments, right? Second Life and, right. uh, and Hangouts, and there's a lot of experimentation that's gone on. Some of those things have fallen flat on their faces, and some of them have some limited usage. I think we're still haven't gotten to the point that Randy's talking about where we've, hey, we've got that chalk that I can take it from you and work work together. And so there's a lot that we still need to do there. But that's that's the fun part. You know, we've got we've got a lot of interesting challenges to try to figure out. Yeah. And, there's, uh, a, there's another aspect to this, too, which and I don't want to uh, abuse your time here, Peter. We're going to be concluding in a second. But just to add to what has already been said, um, right now I can, and, and in fact I have turned my camera on and off if I'm taking a gulp of wine or whatever, uh, you can do, there are many ways that you can not show what you're doing, for example, and let's face it, that's obvious, for obvious reasons, desirable at many times. If you're in a meeting room, uh, the subtlety here is someone says something, uh, one person might be extremely irritated by it or just have some horribly negative or positive, let's face it, reaction to it. So if there's four of us sitting in a room, or however many we are now, sitting, if we were all sitting in the same room and somebody said something and Peter said something, um, there could be like a, this flush of excitement that went through some of the people or whatever, and you're never going to get that on video. So I'm not even saying you should try or what's, you know, what Node.js is going to do. <laughs> That's not my point. But the point is that there will always be this difference. Uh, in the discussion with my wife, I feel like they should be able to, maybe one out of three, they should just be able to get that group on video, and I don't want to hear about the train. But since the people they're working for uh, are willing to pay the expenses, you know, that's the way it goes. And unfortunately, I don't think in their case they are chilling or having dinner, you know, there isn't that. So this is one of those moments where the technology really should be able to take over, and the, their problem is, I believe, a lag in the acceptance of the technology, which we could talk about for another hour, but I'll shut up and we won't. Um, let's go back to, go ahead, uh, Tim, I think. You I was just, just going to say very briefly what I found is that actually if you have met people and you've worked with them or whatever, physically spent time with them, then this kind of medium and the, the higher the fidelity of this kind of medium, the better this kind of medium works best. So, I mean, you know, somebody I've worked with for a very long time, if I get really high def audio, then I can tell the subtleties of whether they want to do this task or not. Whereas if it's over a crap GSM call, I had to listen to only the words. I can't get the the overtones. I can't get the tension in the in the larynx or whatever. 
and I think the same is true with the you know the higher quality video only really works if you know what that facial expression means from that person because you've met them and you've got drunk with them or whatever it is. <laughs> That's a great place to end getting drunk with your coworkers. Uh, anyway, it, turn, it is. Turn, really. <laughs> I just want, Peter. Thank you. It's been great. Uh, you and I have never met, and I don't even think I've spoken to you before. But terrific. Thank you very much for accepting Michael's uh, invite. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Great. And don't hesitate to come back any old time. Do oh, we have I a URL we need to communicate for your uh, Kickstarter yet, or not? Uh, if you go to talkie.io, T-A-L-K-Y.io, that's that's our talkie site. We'll have a link to there. All right, everybody go there now and make this happen. Michael, thanks, man. You did a great job of uh, recruitment and a great Thank job you. of producing. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, happy to chat, and, and even more so. I should tell you one thing before we close this out. Talkie.io is my, uh, my go-to thing. It's what I tell podcasters to try when I'm trying to get them off the PSTN and onto something that's going to give them better audio because... That's my passion. Everybody should be as if we're right next to each other. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll terminate. I keep talking over your <laughs> answer, Peter. I'm so sorry. Take care. All right, we're going to conclude the broadcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening and for taking part.